Hey, this is Jason Roselle, and welcome to Get Inspired, the official podcast and YouTube show that will empower your mind, body, business, social media branding, relationships, and anything that's holding you back from becoming the best version of you. Listen, before I became a TV personality, an author, a celebrity trainer, a life and wellness coach, and the founder of Caliente Fitness, I was broke obese for 20 plus years, full of stretch marks, full of excuses, and most importantly, here's the deal. I was unhappy. I was able to change my life completely, and since then, I've helped thousands do the same. This show is gonna bring you awesome guests, tons of helpful programs that'll aid you, but most importantly, your questions and topics that will make this show your show. My question is this. Are you ready to get inspired? Well, get ready, because the show starts now. Welcome to Get Inspired with Jason, the podcast and YouTube show where we get your mind caliente. We get your body caliente. Most importantly, we get your emotions so, so calientito. You know why? Because it's about you and your life. Today, we have a special guest. It is therapist and relationship expert, Dr. Elizabeth Frederick, she goes by Liz. What's up, Liz? Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. This is so exciting. You are so welcome. I uh, I have to say I've been very, very um, excited about having you because I ran into your Instagram account not too long ago. And everything that you were posting, I was like, me and my clients can resonate with this <laughs> so effortlessly because you're speaking on so many layers of life. You know, um, obviously being a therapist, being a relationship expert, I like how you combine and bring in different aspects that can make someone that has never worked with a therapist before, you know, more prone and comfortable to say, hey, you know what? I relate to Liz, you know, and I said, you know what? I want to bring you on my platform because what you have is gold and we're ready. Whoever's watching or listening to get some good gold. I got to ask you, what caused you to become a therapist, a relationship expert? Have you ever dealt with trauma, panic, anxiety? Have I just give it to me? Yeah, no, for sure. I so starting in childhood. So, yes, um, grew up in a an upbringing that did create quite a bit of trauma, anxiety, depression. I was probably in about middle school when I first started to notice the symptoms. Now, obviously, grew up um, low income. And so there wasn't, the resources weren't there. The, even the awareness for my parents, they're probably didn't know what it was, couldn't put a name to it. Right. And so I suffered through that for a really long time until about my early to mid twenties, when I went back to school, I started my degree in psychology, then did my master's in professional counseling and eventually did my doctorate in psychology as well. And through my own education is when I became aware of like, oh, okay, this is what was going on at a really young age. And this is what it has turned into and evolved into over time. And so, yes, trauma, anxiety, depression, ADHD, OCD, you name it. I've got it. (laughs) Winner, winner, chicken dinner on that. So I've been able to work through a lot of it, though. And and as you're saying, I think that that's where a lot of um, the relatability that I have comes in because I'm going through it along with everyone else. I love that you said and you take ownership, I'm going through it in present tense, Yeah. right? And my audiences know very well that, you know, this was something, anxiety, depression, et cetera, that I've been fighting in the past. Fight, fight, fight. Oh, I'm the winner, right? I'm the winner. I'm not going to let this beat me. And it wasn't until, you know, not too long ago where I, I, I realize it's, they're my friends. They're not good friends, but they're not going to go away. Right. And you know this better than anybody. What do you tell someone that when they're going through that major intense panic attack, right? Their throat locks up, their hands start getting shaky and they just, they want to run. What do you tell someone? We got to ride the wave. It's um, we call it urge surfing or emotion surfing. And the idea is that we know. So, Jason, you and I especially we've gone through these 
really highs and lows of the anxiety and depression, all, all of those things. And yet we're sitting here together on a Tuesday morning, beautiful day. We're okay. Yep. We've been through it and we're, we're okay. We're going to get to the other side of it. And so that is what I encourage my clients to be aware of is that in the moment, it feels so debilitating. I, I know I've been there. It feels so overwhelming. It feels so debilitating, but we can sit in that discomfort and we can be aware of what this is and what this isn't. And we can allow the wave to, you know, hit its peak and then come down the other side. But we have to be prepared with those emotional regulation skills we have to be prepared with the logical self-talk to even be able to process through in that moment what's going on and what's the truth about going on that's going on. And I encourage my clients to really ask themselves, is, is the way I'm looking at this from a place of truth or a place of trauma? And that can be really informative in those moments because is the fact that I feel like my world is crumbling true or is it because my nervous system is just really overwhelmed in this moment? Yes. Wow. 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 Okay. That was such an amazing and powerful answer because what you said, there's just so much validity behind it and it's the truth. And we just sometimes have to face the truth. Now I'm going to be very vulnerable with you. I like to put myself in someone's shoes and I'm going to be that person and I'm going to be, this is me. What do you tell someone like myself? I don't have scary thoughts. I don't have crazy debilitating like, you know, like what I used to have, bad, bad panic attacks. What do you tell someone, like I call myself hyper happy, right? I always am just, my battery is just going. So if anything, I always work on calming myself. And no, I don't smoke the ganja, okay? <laughs> Even though I did when I was younger, well, we can go break it down. No, but you, you get what I'm saying. I'm always like, even right now, my throat's a little dry. I'm like, am I doing a good job? She's doing a great job. You, an overthinker that pre-anticipates. I self-diagnose myself, okay? Yeah. Anxiety. What do you tell someone that, that's kind of like always overthinking of the next five seconds? That, so that's still emotional regulation. So even if you are, if it comes out with excitement and energy, Anxiety and excitement are, are are the same coin. And so you just found a way to channel it differently. You found a way to manifest it in a different way, but it's still excessive energy at the end of the day. And so it's learning how to regulate that. And when we're constantly overthinking, we have to practice grounding skills. We have to practice mindfulness skills. We have to practice being able to pull ourselves to this present moment. And so it's really challenging those unproductive thoughts. Um, a big part of that is increasing your self-awareness around those thoughts. So you have to start becoming aware, which it sounds like you personally are. But when those thoughts start to come up, a question I ask myself is, is there value in this thought? And if there's not, meaning, is it going to change the outcome? Is it going to actually keep me safe? Is there anything I can do? No, there's not value in it. So I'm going to redirect because I'm a really busy woman and I do not have time to waste you know, that resource, that energy yes. on these unproductive thoughts. So that's how I redirect it. It's a lot of logical self-talk, checking in, assessing is their value here. And if not, redirecting. Love it. Love it. You know, I usually ask all the audiences, you know, a hot seat question in the beginning and it totally slipped my mind because I was so ready. <laughs> You're to, ready to go. Right. <laughs> Good stuff. If you could have any superpower, any Liz, give it to me. What would it be? Um, I would like to be able to like add more hours to my day. That would be really great. Um, and then also like flying or getting places quicker would be great as well. Um, anything that would be time saving for sure is, would be a superpower. I would be all for. Yes, yes, yes. Single, divorced, married. I'm divorced and divorced, single. And was married. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I, I, yeah, I got you on that one. I caught yes, myself. I'm divorced and, um, and single. Right on. How do you, well, let me, I always ask this to anyone that's in the journey, right? Um, you obviously, uh, Liz, for many of you don't know, she owns three practices, correct? Mm -hmm. Here all over in Arizona and obviously has a phenomenal, strong online presence. I'm going to leave all her information below. We're going to be doing more follow-ups, you know, maybe once a quarter, get my audiences warmed up to you and I'll go on your show. But let me ask you, 
you're a, an entrepreneur, you're a therapist, you're a you know relationship expert. Where do you make time for you, Miss? Oh, Jason. yeah. <laughs> so what I will tell you, and this is not a cop out, though it's going to sound that way. I am genuinely so passionate about mental health. I'm passionate about my online community. I'm passionate about connection. So the things that I spend my day doing, I, as silly as it sounds, it is fun to me. It's what I enjoy doing. And so what I really do like to do, though, is like a couple of weeks ago, I went to New York for a couple of days. And because of a lot of the stuff that I do, I can do it virtually. I was able to work while I was there, but it was just really removing myself from my everyday environment and just being in a new environment, which was so inspirational, just the creativity that came from it and the fulfillment that provided. And so to answer your question, I don't necessarily carve out these big chunks of time to, you know, take bubble baths or get massages or things of that nature. But I do try to travel is something that really fills my cup. And so if I can travel and do these other things simultaneously, that's where I take time for me. Perfect. Perfect. I work with, and I'm friends with many female entrepreneurs, male entrepreneurs. <clears throat> I always ask the key question though. You're so busy. You obviously have your own balance, which is phenomenal. Do you want that other special counterpart to you in your life? Because some people don't. And if you answer yes, how will you make time for them? So my answer is no ish. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I enjoy spending time. I'm dating someone currently, and so we'll see each other occasionally. We're not in a committed relationship. We're both okay. on the same page about that. But I get a lot of my fulfillment in that way. And he's I went to New York with him, and like, like just to have that he works just as much as I do. So being able to sit across from each other working, and I don't I have no desire for a committed relationship. He knows yeah. that I have no desire to ever live with anyone again, to be married again, anything like that. Yeah. So I do, of course, like any human, I do have a desire for connection, um, yep. but I do not have a desire for commitment, if that answers your question. That was actually a very well expressed. Most people, I catch them off guard. They're like, well, you know, I just opened up this other restaurant and da 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 da. I mean, I would like a girlfriend, but, you know, there's always that but, you know. Right. Um, so good for you. The fact that you know who you are, what you want. And managing your expectations, your own boundaries, and the fact that you set that. And I think this is a one, one of the biggest issues people have, at least in my practice, whether it's in their fitness, you know, whether it's in their relationships, they don't really have boundaries. They go into it like, oh, let's just go with the flow. No, motherfucker, part of my French. You can't just go with the flow. You got to know what you want, right? And if the other party is not on the same page, woo, right? Well, and that's where I feel really lucky is that I, I've been any man I've talked to in that way. I'm very upfront right away and they can, you know, take it or leave it. I'm again, that's maybe one of the perks of not desiring commitment is I, I don't really, it doesn't bother me if that's not okay for you. Um, the other piece of that is my ex-husband is my best friend. And so not a whole lot of people are thrilled about that either. Um, so with these factors that I'm not willing to negotiate on, it's, yeah. it's great to find somebody who's okay with that and um, is, just can go with the flow. Yep. And some people, like you said, they may look at like someone, whether it's a male or a female that has kids and, the, you know, oh my God, the ex, oh, that's baggage. Look, sometimes it's all about perspective, right? To some it's gold. It's like, oh my God, that's so cool. Liz has kids and sure, she may be best friends with the ex-husband, but now I have a family I can be a part of, right? Some people <laughs> may look at that psychologically very different and that's their freaking loss and it's all good, right? Yeah. It, so, it is all good. No love lost there. Thank you. And here we go. Next question for only $4.99. Ladies and gentlemen, you ready? <laughs> ready, ready, ready? All right, here we go. Here we go. So how do you know when you're not in a healthy relationship? We're taking you away from the equation. So everyone that's listening or watching, how do you know when you're not in a healthy relationship for people that are dating, married, or super serious? Your daily mood states and, and the activation of your nervous system, which a lot of people do not pay attention to, especially in our Western society. We are not mindful of what happens in our bodies throughout the day. When our stomachs are clenching or cramping, when our hearts are racing, this has become such a norm for so many of us, whether it's because of our trauma, our busy lifestyles, that we don't stop to become aware of that. 
But those are going to be the main cues that help us to really determine if a relationship is healthy or good for us. Because the reality is we spend a lot of time talking about red flags. Um, I, I have a reel coming up about this here soon. And we talk about red flags, but we don't stop to consider that maybe this isn't a red flag. It's just an incom incompatibility issue. So you're just not compatible. That doesn't mean there's something inherently wrong with that person's behavior. For example, if somebody works a lot, that might not feel good to you because you want more of their attention, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a red flag, a universal red flag, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so a good way to be aware of if you're in a healthy relationship or not is how are you feeling day to day in that relationship? Do you feel safe? Do you feel secure? Do you feel connected? Are you excited to see that person, but also feel safe when you tell that person you're not available that night to see them? And so really the... Um, the way that your body is feeling, and if you can feel at peace, that's a really good indicator. Um, I could go through all the do's and don'ts, all the this and that. I can give you a whole list. But the reality is that list doesn't apply to everyone. But how our bodies feel does apply to everyone. No, I completely agree. I mean, there's so many levels of it. I mean, me per se will use me as a guinea pig. You know, there's been different phases of my life. You know, there's been a phase where, say, I was very egocentric right? I'm on TV every freaking week for three years in a row. So I'm okay. thinking, yeah, I was very inconsiderate. Let's just leave sure. it at that, right? So of course, anytime I was triggered, it was because I was hurting the other person's feelings, right? So, you know, I like how you say, you know, you feel it, right? I, and I wasn't at peace. I was like, why are they not happy? You know, I give them this, I do that. And they made me self-reflect, right? And I was like, oh, damn. Right. But what do you do when when two parties, for example, I know plenty of couples that they're both good people and they're both in, you know, they they do as best as they can, but they the synergy in the way they express themselves or even their love languages, right? They're very different. Like in other words, on paper, they're good for each other, right? Okay. One's introverted, one's extroverted, and many millions of couples are like this. But what if like the style of communication of one party is so different that it irks the other person, even though this person didn't say anything wrong, right? right. Or, and, or maybe this person's not even insecure, but it's what they're used to in the past. In the past, didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. Is that a green light, good relationship that has potential? Or is that more like, oh, you may want to look elsewhere? So again, that, I mean, you just gave a really great example of the compatibility piece that I'm referring to, that these can be two really good people who don't have these universal red flags. And when I say the universal red flags, just to touch back again on the unhealthy relationships, this would be the abusive behavior. So physically, mentally, emotionally abusive, constantly putting someone down, humiliating them, harming them. Those are all red flags and indicators of an unhealthy relationship. So just to your audience, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not excusing that just because someone's okay with it. That stuff is not okay. What right. I'm referring to is more exactly what you just described, that it's a difference in, in love languages or hobbies or uh, morals, values, worldviews. And when that becomes the case, those two people get to decide, are you worth it? enough for me to compromise and make changes to meet you in the middle. And mm. that's what it often comes down to. So can we sit in the discomfort of the differences in our communication style? And can we figure out how to get closer together? Can we bridge this gap together? Mm. Now, one person might be all for that and the other person maybe not. And that's going to be the best indicator of if that relationship can work or not. The differences are not the issue because you can work together to figure that out. It's how much do you want to figure that out? And then are you willing to figure that out? Are you willing to do what it takes to not get your way? And then I always tell my clients at the end of the day, it comes down to acceptance or change. You either accept who your partner is and you figure it out or you don't and you change. And, and that's there's no right or wrong. It's what works best for you. Absolutely. Wow. That was such a fulfilling answer for anybody that's you know going through stuff and you know we i one of the thing and guys please follow if you're not already just literally put this on pause dr elizabeth fedrick on instagram she every day it's like it's like a happy birthday you know it's <laughs> like if it's not helping me it's helping and share it 
because sharing yeah. is caring. You know, uh, I love everything you said. And I think it comes down to, like you said, accepting, you know, and wanting to change or not. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we look at things and, and people on paper. Oh, well, this looks good on paper. You know, this should work out. Or a lot of times people want instant gratification, right? So a lot of times, like I've helped people in, in their relationships in the past, you know, sometimes you have to do the pro and cons list with all of your past to see where you're at and ask yourself, what is what has worked in the past? What isn't working now? And how can you connect the dots? A lot of times people are like, well, let's just talk about sex, right? I had so much sex with this partner and that partner. This partner is so much better on paper. She cooks, she does this, but I don't have sex with them barely, you know? And I'm like, well, what's more important to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> what That's What right. is more important? Oh, you know, or like, well, let's talk about values, you know? Um, my ex, for example, had, not my ex, but like say they'll say, my ex had awesome values, um, and and but they were very introverted. And, you know, I didn't feel like I could be myself, you know, okay. what do you tell people like in these, these are kind of gray areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it comes down to the priority because I sit with clients all the time and have those conversations. They're, they make a great partnership and they're incredible co-parents and they manage the home together. Their dual incomes are just their powerhouses. But like you're saying with the sex, they don't have sexual chemistry or they don't have sex very often. And that's hard for one or both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and what we sit with is what is most important to you? So if you sit there, yes, technically we could find a partner where we could have it all. Okay, fine, fair. But I'm not, I, I tell my clients, like, I am not a fairy godmother. So if that's what you're looking for, that's not what's happening. What I'm helping you to realize is what are the traumas you're bringing into it? What are the triggers you're bringing into it? And how can you show up more healthy in this relationship? regardless of if it's perfect or not, which by the way, it's not going to be perfect. Mm. And so we have to sit with what is most important to us. So for some people, that sexual chemistry, that's what matters. And for other people, it's the partnership. That's what matters. Um, for myself, that's something that, you know, realizing that I don't want to be committed, that I don't want to live with somebody, all of those things. Connection is important to me, mm -hmm. but I don't want the commitment. I'm a strong, independent woman. I don't need a partner in that way. I don't need someone to take care of me. And so I don't want that. And so I help people to really sit with what is their priorities. So for a lot of my clients, whether they're in a relationship or not, we do a five wants, five needs, and five boundaries list so that they can really clearly identify these are the things I need in a partner. These are the things that would be nice preferences. And then these are like the deal breakers. And often that helps people to really determine, should I stay with this person or is it probably a good choice for me to keep looking? Yeah. I like that a lot. And you made me think in my background is PR and marketing. You could create a course. Okay. And if you end up doing this, I do expect my 5% residual <laughs> Um, on God. And I can't believe I'm telling you this, but the way you expressed it was, look, I don't, I don't, I don't need that commitment. You know, I don't need all these things. I'm a strong, independent woman. Right. <laughs> Imagine if you created a course that said the following, what if I showed you the ways, the ways, excuse me, to be super successful financially, super confident in your mind, your body, your soul. Would you want a husband then? Would you want to live? Oh, oh with you. <laughs> Sounds like we we have something we're about to partner up on. Your audience hears it first he, right here. I'm, I'm just <laughs> saying. And then next, you know, me and you are partnering. It's like, ladies, you don't need a guy like me. Trust me. I'm only good to look at certain times of the day. I smell good because I put my Tom Ford on and, you know, and I'll give you some smoochy smoochy, but that is it. Right. And that's all they need you for. That's how they just want to look at you, get a little connection. And then that's it. Sorry. Right. But the rest of the time, you know, for only $5,648, I'm going to show you the Dr. Elizabeth Frederick way where you don't need a damn. And then woman will be like, I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. <laughs> Full song and dance routine. I, I see it. It's a million dollar in the making. Millions oh. of dollars in the making even. Oh, thank you for being such a great sport. We're having fun. That's the best part about this, right? 
Um, okay, so you 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 identified and talked about so many things. I think you gave us enough on those topics for us to to really dive deep and and make a decision and go from there. And and guys, don't be hesitant if you have further questions for me or Liz. Drop it in the comments, shoot her a DM or say, Hey, I heard you on Jason's thing, yada yada, or vice versa. You know, anyone that's in your audiences are saying, Hey, Jason. You know, I, I just want to, you know, rock out my body a little bit with my mind. Hit me up. Let's do it. Yes. Now, check this out. What do you what do you tell people that have tech stationships? Yes. Mm -hmm. Relationships that are predominantly texting all day long. And you're lucky if you talk to them for five minutes on the phone for serious committed relationships, that is. Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't know who has time for that because when I'm sending a long text and I'm like, holy shit, I just wasted so much time on that text. So yeah. first and foremost, you guys are wasting your time that could be spent much more productively. But on top of that, there there is so much tone and there is so much messaging and context that is lost through text yes. that really distorts not only the conversation, but really the relationship. And it can create conflict that doesn't need to be there. And it creates misunderstanding and all of these things. And also, it's never going to build the connection that is needed for true emotional intimacy. And in order for a relationship to thrive, it has to be founded in emotional intimacy. And you're simply not going to get that through sending text messages all day. It's, it's just not going to happen. Right, because everything gets misconstrued. All it takes is one little wrong thing. Do you yeah. know how many times this has happened to me? Everything is skippity dandy awesome. I'll say one wrong thing. It doesn't matter. It could be my girlfriend, my mom, my friend, whoever. <gasps> Holy crap. It's like War World freaking three. You're yeah. like, really? You know, and then they want explanation. They're not happy. So they go from sending you kiss emojis yeah. to like cold shoulder. Dagger emojis. <laughs> oh my God. Come on. Life short. Yeah. You know? Um, okay. Can two people who are in a relationship, uh, sorry, you already answered that. What do you do when two people who are, say, dating for a long time, and this happens because a lot of times people get afraid or they're afraid to get married, you know, but they love each other. They don't want to let each other go. What do you tell those type of people who are dating for years, but they still don't live together, you know, and they're, they're you know, one of them, especially, there's always one. It's very rare that both are extremely busy. But they barely get to see each other because one party is excessively busy. How and can those type of people keep a relationship, a successful one? This goes back to what we were talking about with priorities. Because if you are so busy that you are not seeing each other, your partner is not your priority. That's, I mean, actions over words always in, in all situations. Yeah. So if that's the case, the, the check-in is really, why am I in this relationship if this person is not a priority? Am I holding this person hostage? You know, are they, am I just afraid to let them go? Because as you were saying earlier, they do look so good on paper. We get caught in that with, you know, we, we have the good catch. And so we don't want to let them go because of that. But we also don't want to attend to them in the way that they need to be attended to or should be attended to. Yeah. And so the first check-in is, do I even want to be in this relationship? Is it a priority if we're so busy? And then the second, it's like, nope, I do. I love this person. I don't want to lose them. I want to make time for them. Then you have to make time for them. And what yeah. that means is that if you're long distance, you are carving out in advance, like heading into the new month. You're scheduling out when you're going to see each other. If you live in the same town, but you're just that busy, it's the same thing. What what night is date night? What night is staycation night? You know, and you're just planning that out in advance. So, I mean, Jason, for people like you and I, who like we are just nonstop from the more you know the morning to the night, mm -hmm. we have to be that intentional with the time that we make for connection. And that means it goes on the calendar in advance. Oh, wow. You, you did it. And there's so many people that are entrepreneurs, coaches like you and myself that they need to hear this, you know, and every aspect is different, but what you said is on point and, and it's delegating, right. And making the decision, what is needed, what is wanted, how are we going to go through this uh, and rock it out? I'm trying to think you said something else through it that really gravitated towards me um, but let's just say, you know, I've seen a flock of so many, um, couples 
and this is obviously your expertise that have either in the past, say, two years, divorce, separated, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we can do an episode on celebrities alone, but my point behind it is, what do you tell those couples? Like I know two or three couples right now, and one that I'm working with personally, that they're in the verge of the breakup, the divorce, you know, and, you know, they blame a lot of it on, say, changes because you can't help it. COVID came, it was a major drastic change, right? And then came this past year, right? Where it's like, it's like getting used to what is normal again, right? I know, I know several people that can say, hey, I, I barely see my husband, maybe, maybe at most 20, 30 minutes a night, and then he has to get up because he's readjusting this past year. And he keeps on telling me, baby, it's just this year, you know, and, and it's even for me, even though I coach people, I'm asking you, you're more proficient in this. What do you tell those people that, you know, they're, they're hanging on, they're like, well, when am I going to see them? You know, like, in, and you can't get mad at the, they can't get mad at their partners. Why? Because it's their job, you know, they, they have to pay their bills. So what do you tell someone? It's time for a hard conversation. And so it's time to open this up to some vulnerability to really express, this is how I'm feeling about what's going on. This is where some of my needs are being unmet and what can we do about it? And when it comes to those type of situations, no, that partner is not going to be able to change everything to give the, give their other partner maybe what they need all day, every day. But they can make some adjustments that demonstrates efforts towards change. And often it's those efforts in and of themselves that really helps us to realize that our partner cares. Like, yes, we do want the change to take place, but the effort towards the change sends us a message that we matter, that we're important and that we're a priority. And really when we're starting to feel triggered and activated, that's generally why, is because we're either feeling rejected or abandoned. And what you're describing in that scenario would create both of those feelings. I'm being rejected and abandoned by my partner and they're making work their priority. And so how can we just make some adjustments? And sometimes, I mean, that's even scheduling out in advance like we talked about and saying, all right, babe, I hear you, I see you, I want to show up for you. Can we please look down, sit down, look at the calendar together and identify when we can spend two nights next week quality time um, that is goes a really long way for the person who's not getting their needs met. Yeah. And the person that's not getting their needs met, because I've had people that are in that boat and they're lashing out, you know, why don't yeah. you make time for me? You know, I barely see you. I feel abandoned. And, you know, the the lesson here from what you just said, too, is how you express that to someone that's extremely overwhelmed with their work. They're trying to stay afloat above water. <laughs> Right. So the way you express that to someone is in a kind way saying like, like, look, I feel left out. I feel abandoned. You know, I would love for us to work on, you know, making this work, because if you scream at someone, if you delegate it in a negative way, that's going to cause even more friction. Am I right? You lose your audience right there. The message is lost. As yep. soon as you express it in a way that activates their nervous system, they can no longer be present for your needs. They go into survival. And now they're just worried about their own needs. And so, yeah, it becomes really um, unproductive at that point. And actually, this app, probably in a couple hours, I'll ha I have a post coming out about having hard conversations. So go check that out because I'm providing steps on what that looks like in this exact scenario. Your needs aren't being met. You need to have a conversation about it. Here are some steps to do that. Yeah. And how to convey the message. You know, uh, I always say to myself, you know, make it about them more than making it about yourself because you don't know what the other person is going through, exactly. right? You know, if they have a lot of pressure, especially if they have children, I mean, you, you, you have a child, you know, and you're wanting more than that someone can give. Hey, if you're going to ask for it, deliver it in a right. way where they're going to be like more encouraged to give you that, right? Yeah, where they're feeling empathy and validation as well. That you have understanding for what's going on and you have an unmet need. So how can we how can we meet both? Um, yeah. And that's how yeah, you described it beautifully. Last question before we get let, let you go. What do you tell couples that and this is I'm sure you get this question a million times. So sorry if I'm redundant. What do you tell couples that in the beginning of their relationship and say they're very sexual, passionate, all right, that they're having intimacy, sex three, five times a week. Right. And then. 
Year goes by, that diminishes. The next year, what do you tell couples? What advice do you give them? Because there's always one that has more needs than the other. Like I said before, there can be someone that's more introverted, extroverted. How do you make that happen or mix it up to stay in a monogamous, healthy relationship? Yeah. So the first and foremost is we have to normalize that that's going to happen, that over time that the first chemistry really heightened state of infatuation with each other is not going to last. That's not the human brain is designed for novelty. So we get really excited about novelty. That doesn't novelty can no longer be novel when it's been around for a while. Right. That defeats the whole thing. And so then at that point, we have to figure out how do we bring back the novelty? And so if that is really important to one of the partners, and I really like to reinforce this, it does not have to be important to both partners in order for it to be a priority. Even if it's important to one person, it should be a priority. Um, and so ways should be found of how can we spice this up? How can we get the spark back? And a lot of that comes through first, the emotional intimacy. So how much time are you putting in daily and weekly into connection to feeling safe and vulnerable? That goes for all genders. That is not women specific. All genders need that. And then the next is how can we create novelty? Is this toys? Is this outfits? Is this finding new positions? Is this having sex in new places? What is whatever that looks like, that novelty will create the chemistry and spice it back up. So first check in on your emotional intimacy and then second on what is new and different. Yes, that was so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You bring a lot of clarity because a lot of people have asked me this before, and I like to hear from your perspective, and we only have about 90 seconds left. But I like how you said connect with the emotions first so everyone's happy and validated because then the rest happens. There's many people, and I can say I was one of those people. I was not very emotional and and when I was in my 20s, right? Even as I got older, you realize you have to connect because sex is sex, right? And you can be in a relationship with someone that say say two people are extremely sexual. They might not even care to fix the emotional part. They're like, okay, I know we're fighting. Let's just have sex. That doesn't resolve anything, right? Never. So right. I, wow. Can we do a part two soon? Uh, absolutely. And then a part two and a half or three when you come hang out with me. And then and then when we do our big Dr. Liz method, multi-million dollar company. I mean, Jason, you're you're stuck with me now. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please get ready because 2023 is a major takeover from your mind, your body, your soul. Dr. Elizabeth Frederick, you rock, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for having me. This was a lot of fun. Great conversation. Likewise, I'll talk to you soon. And as always, keep it caliente. See ya. Make sure to subscribe to my channel if you're a new viewer. And don't forget to click on the bell so you can get notifications every time a new show releases. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and feel free to leave your comments. I'm Jason Roselle, and you're watching Get Inspired with Jason.